So urban mobility at an inflection point. Um, the world is changing. And it, the first two keynotes were so great because they highlighted that. And I think they were inspirational versus sort of downers, right? I think we need to keep things uh, positive. Um, but when you think about it, it's not just urban mobility at an inflection point. When you think about it, it's really our society at an inflection point worldwide. It's, it's how do we plan? It's who do we plan for? It's our entire economy that was based on fossil fuels being completely reinvented, right? Around electrification, renewables. And I mean, it's a, it's a wholesale change potentially in politics generationally and, and how we govern. So I think that urban mobility is so fascinating because it's literally the lifeblood of our cities. And therefore it's sort of representative of all the other change that's happening or needs to happen. And we couldn't have a better panel. Um, actually, I'm gonna move a little so I can see all of you. Um, than these folks uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with. And I think everybody here has either worked in or run more than one agency, right, in government. I actually, my name's Gabe Klein, by the way. I, uh, I um, ran the Washington DC Department of Transportation and the Chicago Department of Transportation. But most of my career has been in the private sector. And now I'm a partner in City Fight. We work with cities. And I've had the opportunity to work with many of these guys. Um, Ulyss and I actually worked together in Washington, DC 10 years ago. And then he went on to Houston uh, and then went on to run Denver and now is running Miami-Dade. And before I turn it over to everybody to introduce themselves, um, could you just talk about what you do, uh, how big your sort of region is that you serve or geography, and what are you most excited about in 2022? as 2021 ends. We were all saying we couldn't wait till 2020 ended and 2021 was gonna be so much better. Did it end 2020? Is it over I don't yet? Know. It's like the longest year ever. Um, so why don't we start down there with, with Euless? Yeah, thanks Gabe, appreciate it. So I'm Euless Cleckley. I'm the newly minted uh, director and CEO of the Miami-Dade County Department of Transportation and Public Works. Um, it's great to see everybody here on the panel. Uh, we, we have a lot of interactions with each other and great, and Gabe is great to see you. And I love your uh, support code. <laughs> so, uh, so currently uh, my department, we are responsible for uh, all public uh, transportation. We have three uh, main modes of our public transit system. We have a Metro rail system, it's about 25 miles, 23 stations uh, that connects uh, regionally uh, the county. Uh, we also have what is called a Metro Mover, it's a people mover system downtown, connects uh, areas of activity to downtown Brickles, about 4.4 miles of uh, elevated uh, Metro Mover track. And then we have our workhorse of our system, which is our bus network. Uh, and so we have a lot of enhancements that we're working on currently to really modernize our transportation system across all of our trans, uh, public transportation needs. Uh, also in my department, we are responsible for roads and bridges, canals, uh, and just general maintenance within a right of way. So it's 4,000 people uh, and it's a county that has 34 separate municipalities within a county very similar to, to LA County. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about where we are as a county. We, uh, back in 2002, passed a surtax, half penny surtax, uh, that we finally are moving forward with building out certain elements of what we call our smart plan. Our smart plan is a plan of projects that are going to, to connect the county. Uh, we have six major high capacity transit corridors and we're finally starting to move forward with that program. Uh, and the federal dollars that are going to come down the pike is going to help us be able to accelerate those programs moving forward. So all I see uh, uh, is opportunity and particularly from a technology standpoint, uh, we have a lot of resource and a lot of focus from a policy and planning perspective to advance our county from uh, where we are now to leveraging technology to move us uh, better and more efficiently as we move forward. So, so I'm excited. Jerry. Thank you very much, Gabe, and welcome everybody. What a way to start. Those were tremendous uh, speeches. And so uh, my name is Jerry Dobravani. I'm the CAO and commissioner at Metro Vancouver. And so just to confuse you, Metro Vancouver does not provide transit services in, in Canada. Uh, TransLink is our, our transit provider. They have uh, major roads and, and the bus system and the rapid transit system. Metro Vancouver is a regional form of government. 
uh, we have major utilities, water, sewer, uh, um, solid waste. So when we talk about decarbonizing, there's tremendous opportunities to treat our, our waste as a resource and how we're getting gas and heat and everything out of that. Also, we do regional planning. So uh, we coordinate for 23 members, uh, our regional planning efforts. And so uh, sometimes we like to say that the best transportation plan is a good land use plan in terms of where we put people, where we put jobs, keeping green what's green, put people where there are people, put jobs where there are jobs, building complete, complete communities where there's really a focus on, on pedestrian, uh, pedestrian environment and um, creating cities where it's easy for people to walk. And uh, we'll talk about the Olympics if you want at some point, because we hosted the Olympics in 2010. Um, you know, we lost one third of our road system because of security closures, and we saw a 45% increase in trips. So it was a, a fascinating challenge. And what saved us was walking and transit, because um, you could just dial those up uh, to double or triple. There were no other forms of uh, transportation that you could crank up that high. So um, um, I'm really excited about the opportunity, and I think that uh, I, I guess I'll close by we, we know what we need to do. You've heard, you heard from the speakers this morning. Um, you heard from other sessions you'll hear later today. So we know what we need to do. We just need to find a way to do it. Uh, when was yesterday? We should have started a long time ago. And, uh, and, and I'd like to kind of focus on the hows and how do we get it started right away? Because it's not a mystery what we need to do, we know. And so we just need to start doing it. Every decision we make, every report we bring forward, are we moving closer or further away? Uh, from where we need to be and more importantly are we moving fast enough and usually the answer to that last question is no we're not moving quickly enough thanks and stephanie yes stephanie wiggins ceo of la metro we are the third largest transit agency in the united states based on ridership um, we are a planner a builder operator and funder of multiple modes um, not just transit, light rail, heavy rail, bus. Um, we now have on-demand transit. I mentioned earlier, micro transit, um, but we have a highway program. We have express lanes, or which are toll lanes, and um, active transportation, a bicycling program through our partnership with LADOT. So I think for 2022, I was just thinking, it's going to be a huge year for LA Metro in 2022. And it's, I don't know if it's quite going to be the year of reckoning, but it's definitely a, a year of reimagining. We are in the process of reimagining our highway program. You will see that next year. We are in the process of reimagining public safety. You will see that next year. Um, some of the fruits of our labor will finally be born as it relates to two mega projects are scheduled to finally open next year. That's a great way to elevate our infrastructure for the residents and visitors. Um, not only do we have two mega projects opening next year, our Crenshaw line and our regional connector project, but we have two, um, I think, world sporting events that will put us on a world stage. We're hosting the Super Bowl in February and Major League Baseball's All-Star Game in the summer. So um, there's a lot to do. As I mentioned, we're in the rebuild mode. And the other major element that we're looking at in 2022 for the first time is to really develop a budget that is based in equity. And um, that's not an easy thing to do. So we've got a lot going on in 2022. And Salida. Great. Um, first of all, I just want to second Stephanie's welcome. Welcome to LA. We're so happy you're here. Uh, welcome to Little Tokyo. Welcome to the Japanese American Museum. Um, this neighborhood is really a gem in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a city of immigrants and one of its most beautiful defining characteristics is the neighborhoods um, where you can truly experience um, something really special and, and really genuine. Um, so I hope you get a chance to, to get out and explore. Um, and I have to do that because I work for the city and that's part of my job. Um, but also uh, I, I do run LADOT. We manage and operate about 7,500 miles of streets uh, throughout the city. We uh, oversee about 37,000 parking meters. Um, we actually have a transit system. It moves about 20 million people um, on an annual basis, mostly surface transit, 
Uh, we also oversee for hire permitting. We have about 52 different business lines, so I could be here for a really long time. Um, but that's all to say, you know, we we have a um, we sit inside LA County. We're one of 88 cities inside LA County. So really, a lot of the keys to our success are about collaboration and um, and integration and and uh, with other cities and with the counties. And and as you move around this city you will see our successes and failures at that collaborative integration um, uh, across, you know, across mobility. So um, that's really something that is a, a key focus for us. Um, and the thing I'm really excited about in 2022 is that uh, for the first time we have women running the transportation agencies in this region that are the largest. <laughs> And I'll say, you know, Stephanie's predecessors at, at Metro of the Washington Art Leahy had a necessary um, and urgent focus on funding and building massive infrastructure programs and, and their, their legacy and their leadership is very powerful. Uh, and I'm not gonna take anything away from that. But what I'm really excited about is the fact that, you know, from the beginning of her, her tenure at Metro, Stephanie and, I, Stephanie and I have shared a passionate focus on a equity. And when I say equity, I mean racial equity specifically, and I also mean gender equity. And uh, what I think we can accomplish in our time as caretakers of, of the public right of way and of the systems and of the people that we serve um, for equity, I think is the thing that I'm, that I'm most excited about. And we've laid the groundwork for it. Um, and I know Stephanie is a, a ruthless pragmatist like I am. Um, and, and now we're just going to run hard and get stuff done. So that's the thing I'm very excited about. That's awesome. That, that's inspiring. Thank you. And we were so excited to get to have a little piece to work on the gender equity study that you guys did, which, should, by the way, is awesome. And everybody should go read that. Um, so I thought we'd start out talking about some of the elephants in the room, of which this year there are many. Um, but COVID uh, is really, you know, I, I think we all thought of it as this one time event. It was going to hit us and go. And I think it's been around long enough and it's been severe enough and emotionally debilitating enough um, as evidenced by how many people are quitting their jobs and everything. That it's, really, it, it's really changing the way we live and the way we work. And I don't think things are gonna go right back to normal and you probably don't either. Um, so for us in mobility, it affects us obviously internally, you know, managing staff and all of that, but also the way people move, the way they recreate, um, the way they work. So I guess I would ask, and, and everybody doesn't need to answer every question unless they, unless they want to, but if anybody has thoughts on, you know, how do you think these shifts are going to impact our, trans, our transportation and transit systems long term and our shifting needs in road space? Anybody want to want to start? Jerry? Sure. Well, thank you. Um, I think one thing it's done is made us really nimble um, in terms of big organizations, big bureaucracies how we were able to turn uh, very quickly, not only for our standards, but in general. I mean, our work from home, we didn't allow work from home when I started at Metro two years ago. Um, all of our staff went home and started working from home. I'm still amazed that our IT department didn't blow up, um, but they managed. And so big changes like that, that we've all had to make in a whole number of different areas, I think now are the norm. And so how do we take that in a real positive place to enable some of the big changes we need to make around decarbonizing and changing the way we get around. And so as we become, as we are now more nimble, I think you're right, the future, you know, the first variant that gets through the vaccine, we're right back uh, to where we were, um, but we know what to do. And I think all of us in leadership positions are really positive and can be really positive about how we use uh, that flexibility, the new paradigm we're in to make the big changes that we need to make much more quickly. Anyone else, Salida? Yeah, I was just going to chime in that um, you know the positives, the external positives. I think have been that it's finally we finally busted a lot of myths in transportation during the pandemic. I think one of those myths um, is that transit agencies that relied most heavily on fare box recovery have suffered the most mm -hmm. during the pandemic, but that has not lessened. The, the lifeline need for those transit services for frontline workers and so on. And so I hope that one of the things that we see come out of this is a real shift in how we fund 
public transit and a more expansive definition of what that is and who it's for. Um, I think one of the other myths that got busted was that peak hour trips are what transit exists to serve. Right. And what we see is that, you know, all y'all know that, you know, your, your work trips actually represent a really small portion of the overall trips that you make every day, but they get the lion's share of funding and service. You know, if you have a white collar job where you work from nine to five, transit works okay for you. But what we found during the pandemic is that there are so many other trips that need serving. And Metro really, I think, was leaning into this prior to the pandemic with NextGen, just this acknowledgement that there are so many short trips that are happening all throughout the day that could be served by transit with better headways, et cetera. Um, and I think that's a, an opportunity. There's a fantastic researcher um, at UCLA, Dr. Evelyn Blumenberg, um, that did work even going back to the 80s and 90s um, that said, look, when people shift to a work from home model, yes, there is an initial decrease in vehicle miles traveled, but over time, their movement and the amount that they move around goes back and even exceeds how many trips they were making before. They just happen at different times of the day. So that's maybe, uh, you know, this is not an Urban Land Institute gathering, so I'll just break the bad news that central business districts and real estate in downtowns might suffer for longer. Um, but I think neighborhood-based transportation and neighborhood-based transportation networks and services that really focus on the broader spectrum of people's transportation needs are, I hope, where we can go with our funding and service delivery. Right, it sort of sped up a lot of things that we thought were going to happen, right? You'll see. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Just to add to that, I think that the pandemic really challenged our traditional way of thinking around what does transportation mean, what does mobility mean, and how does it serve the neighborhoods that need it the most. And so going back in my time in Denver, we, we took that as an opportunity to close streets. You know, many of us did that where we opened it up for more biking, more pedestrian type of activity and other uses of the right of way to help support local business. Um, we in Miami-Dade learned from the experience where, uh, to your point, Salito, in terms of looking at non-peak trips and the, depend, the transit dependent population that still relied upon the service. And from that, we actually created a Go Nightly program that we affectionately call it Go Nightly. It's a it's on-demand service that still provided uh, uh, transportation mobility options for folks that needed to get to their places of employment during the, the pandemic from midnight to 5 a.m., where the organization had to actually reduce the amount of service and actually suspend service during that time for certain specific routes. And so I think the pandemic changed government a little bit to think outside of the box, be more nimble and react much more quickly than we otherwise would have. Well, it also proved that we can do that stuff. There you go. Yes. When we have permission and money to do that stuff. And we had this sort of unique, that's another myth that the pandemic busted is that government can't do big things fast. Right. Mm -hmm. just, right. just do it and ask for permission later. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. And then at LA Metro, you know, the team was putting micro in place, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which you talked about earlier. And it seems to me like micro is sort of a perfect post pandemic solution to a lot of these problems. Is that the way you see it, that it's going to grow and be a bigger part of your business? I definitely see it as growing a bigger part of our business. I think in, in general, this pandemic has been a real disruptor. Mm -hmm. And for transit agencies, as uh, my colleagues have shared, um, disruptive in the way we think about delivering the service. And the fact that, again, just a recent survey of those who are using our uh, on-demand have said, um, this is the first time they actually decided to use any parts of our system. That's huge. So we want to lean into that because I do think that um, we need to have systemic structural change in our thinking about how to deliver these services if we really want to meet our climate goals and uh, reduce health disparities. Yeah. And, and Ulysses, you mentioned closing streets. Uh, we closed in Washington, D.C. It was great. Now they're opening back up. We have a safety crisis in a lot of our cities because like a lot of the traffic went away, but we realized that a lot of that traffic was keeping people safe. The congestion was sort of keeping people safe. And then people were speeding like demons and they still are. And we've had a number of kids killed in Washington DC and it's got us thinking about like, well, maybe I'm planting the seed a little bit myself. It's got me thinking about, do we need to close streets permanently like they do in Barcelona? Like, do we need to have neighborhoods closed through traffic? 
So I just want to throw it out there. Like, is, is the pandemic going to change fundamentally the way our neighborhoods work? Or are they still going to be car dominated, you think, after the pandemic? We'll give you a statistic during the Olympics. I mean, it's going back to 2010, but uh, our walking, biking, and transit numbers doubled. And it was our lowest by far on record a number of fatalities in that year by far, uh, less than half. And so then, uh, then the numbers went back up again and, and the fatalities went back up again. So yeah, it, it, I, I think there's a causal link. I think it's such a tricky question because yes, there are tremendous negative externalities that come from driving, whether it's climate, even if all the cars are electric, um, whether it's you know safety. And there was this weird, the, the uh, conventional wisdom rule of thumb was that when the economy went down, that crashes and, and severe and fatal crashes went down. But during the pandemic, we hit an inflection point where we discussed that we didn't even know existed, which I did not want to know existed, um, where there's so little traffic turbulence that slows people down and access traffic calming that people reach really high speeds and actually uh, street racing continues to be uh, a huge issue for us. So a lot of negative externalities, but I think we have to be um, pretty honest about the fact that if you don't have access to a car you don't have economic mobility in most American cities for the reasons that Stephanie pointed out, the number of opportunities that you can access if you have access to a car. I mean, it, it affects everything, including rates of recidivism for people who are trying to, to get their lives back on track after being incarcerated. Um, if they don't have access to a car, they are more likely to end up back in the, the prison system. So. I don't think that transportation, I mean, Stephanie mentioned a year of reckoning, and I think one of the things we have to reckon with is that as dyed-in-the-wool environmentalists who've been fighting on the right side of right for bike lanes and bus lanes for most of our careers, many of us, um, we, we still have to acknowledge that when we say people have to drive less, we need to be really thoughtful about who that message is aimed at, because there are so many folks who've been locked out of opportunity and have not gotten the dividends from our transportation system um, because they don't have access to a car. And I don't have a great answer for it. I have some ideas, but I don't think there's been enough uh, about that. So to your point, yep. yes, we should continue to, to open cars to biking, open streets to biking and walking and treat cars as guests yep. in a lot of places. Um, but I also think we have to be really thoughtful about uh, how we do that and who's at the table we make those decisions and who we are really benefiting, um, and who's receiving the dividends from that action. Yeah, great, great point. All right, well, the second elephant in the room, which was brought up by our, our uh, friend, the, the, the Deputy Minister from the Netherlands, is climate. And uh, I feel like for, I don't know, five or six years, I've been out there beating the drum, like this is an urgent situation. Um, it feels like people are starting to recognize it on both sides of the aisle and so forth. Um, but when you think about climate, resilience, equity, some of these huge issues, they don't really know borders. And I was struck uh, when I was planning for this and then listening to you guys talk this morning that we really all work regionally. And these issues are complex and they take cooperation and collaboration. And I thought we'd start actually with uh, you, Jerry, from Canada, because you guys are just a hell of a lot nicer than we are. And you just like, <laughs> have, you know. No, it's true. I, I always say like see me on a bad day. <laughs> well, I, I always say we have 7-Eleven, you have Tim Hortons. Like we're not that much different, but you have half the fatalities per capita. You guys work better together. You are different. So why don't we start with you? Like, how are you approaching regionality and climate and, and or any of these big issues? It's a it's a big question. Um, so our regional form of government, we're 23 members, there's 21 cities. Uh, uh, Treaty First Nation, and then an electoral area, which is all the other bits that aren't in the city. Um, our board is 40 elected members, so 21 mayors and 19 councillors. It's a weighted vote based on population. On a good day, it's a collaborative form of government, um, but I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, stick handling 40 elected officials. That uh, That is, is tricky. COVID has really been a challenge in terms of uh, now we're meeting remotely. When we built our new building, it was designed to 
to facilitate collaboration. There were lots of meeting areas, there were eating areas, there were areas for the directors to network before and after meetings, because that's where you know the most important work gets done. And so it was all built around a collaborative social environment, which disappeared with COVID. And, and so I'm certainly seeing a difference on the on the board floor around uh, snippiness and, and uh, um, trying to get get people back together again. Um, we're not, we're not um, coming together, I think, as, as often as I'm seeing in the US so far. And so we're still uh, doing a lot more work remotely. Um, I think that the collaboration piece is key. And I think we've, we've talked about earlier about we know some things we need to do around climate and decarbonizing. And there's stuff that we don't know yet around, uh, you know, technology is going to, so a, a bunch of the solutions still isn't invented yet or isn't at scale yet. And so another thing that we do regionally is economic development. And so that allows us as a region that has more than more than half the population of the province and more than 60% of the GDP of the province um, allows us to work together um, on economic development around, uh, you know, green, green technology, clean transportation, we're a, a research center for hydrogen. And so a lot of, a lot of um, you know, our solution still needs to be developed uh, for society. And, uh, and I think that's part of the regional collaboration to help us uh, uh, deal more effectively uh, that way. But certainly, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give up on the downtowns. Um, you know, cities have been around for thousands of years. There's a reason people like to get together. You know, what I described in our boardroom around people needing to be together and have that connection, I think people need in their downtowns as well. Um, in Vancouver, we added 100,000 residents in the downtown core. Three quarters of the trips to work are by walking. Um, that's a way to, to reduce travel in your downtown core. It's a way to invigorate your downtown core. So yeah, I wouldn't give up on downtowns. I think we're going through quite a, an interesting time. And I think the regionalization collaboration is, is really key. And that's part of what we're looking at uh, here in this conference around economic development. Great. And um, hey, Ulysses, you're new to Miami. That is one complex environment down there. No, that was easy. 34 cities. Right. And then you got the, um, the unincorporated area. So like that's, yes. that's like your city. How are you dealing with, with regionality and getting everybody to sort of move towards the same goals? I, I, I simply put, I think we're working on it. I do think in South Florida, there's definitely an appetite and a need um, when you start looking at your future transportation system to make sure it's done in a regional way. Uh, I mentioned before our SMART uh, plan, which is our major significant capital investment within South Florida, but one of our major corridors it's called the Northeast Corridor. It's uh, you reutilizing a, a existing rail track, uh, which currently is owned by a private company called Brightline. You probably have heard of it. Uh, there's significant plans to actually have a rail line to connect Miami, downtown Miami, all the way through uh, to Orlando. Now, that's significant. That's a game changer for the state. Is something that we at the county are, are, are going to support at least the first segment, which is going from downtown Miami to a uh, city north uh, called Aventura. It's about 35 minutes away. That's the first segment. It's all in the uh, uh, Miami-Dade County, and we can build that uh, very quickly, uh, uh, leveraging not only our surtax dollars, but also some, some federal dollars and in partnership with um, a, a operator moving forward. Uh, now we're we're in talks with the uh, the remaining counties to figure out how we can actually make this project uh, come to fruition. And regardless of who the operator is, is going to be able to connect multiple regions and connect the state. And that's a game changer. And that's something that uh, we're going to continue to support as a county. Yeah, and and I'll note that Brightline um, is operating now from Miami to Aventura. Correct. They they restarted to West Palm Beach. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they restarted service back uh, the first week in November. And then they're working on coming out here. And it is amazing. They seem to be able to build quickly and for a low cost per mile. And they, they want to build, I think, Vegas to L.A., which will change your region. You, your region is so complicated. We probably don't even need to talk about that. Well, we're actually nothing compared to the Bay Area. I have to say, I was just sitting here thinking about <laughs> if any of y'all are following the whole seamless Bay Area thing and that, that uh, you know, inside the inside transportation, like, uh, draw, telenovela of, of what they're going to do with all of that. Uh, sometimes I just, I read those articles and I'm like, yeah, it's fine down here. We're doing great. Yeah. 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 Okay. So third elephant in the room, 
uh, again, brought up by uh, both our, our speakers earlier, the infrastructure bill. And I know you're not subject to our infrastructure bill, Jerry, but I'm sure you have something comparable, probably better, right? <laughs> right? Have you had Tim Horton's coffee? It's pretty good. Anyway, um, I mean, look, there were a lot of battles. There was the, the progressives aren't happy. The conservatives aren't happy. People are even like my friend Jeff Speck is on Twitter blaming Buttigieg and President Biden, which I sort of disagree with because we knew there, was, there were going to be compromises. We wanted $75 billion for electrification. We ended up with 15 if you include the rolling stock and everything. Um, but these are still sizable down payments, right? These are big. Um, how are you all thinking about this and how do you parse like the one time because like we, we have a lot of cities that are clients and they're they're lining up for it like it's art money right and it's not this is a generation i mean there is some of that there's one time money but this is a generational shift in how we fund it's 550 billion of additional money over between five and ten years depending on the pot so it's not just lining up for a one-time shot so how are you guys thinking about this and parsing the short term versus the generational shifts in investment and we're Understanding, by the way, that it just got signed last week. So you're, nobody's expected to know everything. Who wants to start? Jerry? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I've got thoughts, but I'm going to leave them for the end. <laughs> Stephanie? Well, again, we're thrilled. Um, I, I think, first of all, while it's the largest investment in transit at the federal level um, since, I guess, Roosevelt, um, the reality is it's overdue. Yeah. So, um, and it's not enough, but the fact that it's here, our, our approach is to lean in and go for it, right? Because we think, again, as we've all said this morning, the pandemic has elevated the importance, the vital importance of the service that we provide. And we think with this type of investment, we can demonstrate to the federal government why this should continue. And this should not be a one-time thing. So I think uh, our our vision is the long game. That's great. Sweet. Yeah, I think that, I mean, how many times have we reauthorized that oh bill before it, right? So it's like, this could be a 20 year infrastructure <laughs> bill, um, given the way that uh, the way that it's gone up until now. And I'll say there's two things about it that I think are fascinating to me. Um, the first is that USDOT for the next five years is gonna have $26 billion of discretionary funding to create new programs yeah. almost entirely under their control. And I think that when you look at who this administration put into positions of power, I mean, of course, Secretary Buttigieg is amazing, but right underneath it mm -hmm. are a bunch of <clears throat> women who ran big city transportation agencies. A bunch of troublemakers with hey, they are. Hey, uh, Stephanie and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Robin Hutchinson, Robin. Polly yeah. Trottenberg, Mira. you know, Mira, Joshi, I could go on and on. Uh, there's a lot of great men there, too. I'm just, you know. There's like two. They're amazing. Keith Benjamin <laughs> just took a job at Federal Highways. Maurice he's, Henderson. He's a badass. Anyway, um, I will say, though, that that's a huge opportunity for making sure that the word urban isn't a dirty word at USDOT and that we get... Um, in, we, we get a national Vision Zero program. We get a national universal basic mobility or racial equity and mobility program. Um, I think those are that's the, the opportunity for collective organizing and influence um, among agencies that want to build stuff. Can't wait to spend that money. Amen to all that money. Um, but the other thing that's sort of interesting is that the Congressional Budget Office said there's going to be money left on the table at the end because we spend it so slowly uh, on transportation and in particular on transit infrastructure. Uh, big time projects, they, they, are, they cost big time dollars and they have big time timelines. But one of the things that occurred to me is, you know, to my earlier point about fare box recovery, maybe, you know, and user fees not being the way that we fund transit is an opportunity to bring some of that funding in to actually make transit um, either very low cost or free and not just transit, but actually, you know, EV car sharing, bike sharing, all of these other sort of extensions of public transit. Um, I think that's an interesting sort of thing to talk about too. Yep. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of other stuff in there that we could be really creative about. There's the 10% of that money is for water, 12% for broadband, 13% for electricity. Why aren't we thinking about how to do integrated projects? You know, that, oh, yeah. that I think is, is going to be the fun of it. 
Yeah, and when we were prepping for this, actually, Metro was talking about how um, for the your team was talking about how they are trying to piggyback with LADOT on a lot of the work mm -hmm. and coordinating better on bus lanes and like all that stuff. But you make a couple really important points, Lita, and that is that over a hundred billion dollars of this trillion dollars is um, up to DOT, right? Mm -hmm. It's discretionary. That's never happened before. Mm -hmm. no. And so we all wanted more money directly to cities. Did, did people not know that? Was it a secret? <laughs> I knew. How did they pull that off? Okay, so I, full disclosure, I, I served on the Biden uh, transition team. <laughs> so I sort of knew. And, and, <laughs> and, and we, look, everybody wanted money directly to cities, but we're like, in lieu of that, it's very hard to do. Yeah. We'll make sure money goes directly to cities. It's just going to be done a different way. Right. And the Republicans don't fight it because it's like earmarks. Like everybody benefits ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, way just a little bit. I mean, weighing on our screw on, on your, your, uh, <laughs> your embarrassment of riches. Um, so, uh, I mean, first of all, you, you introduced it by what it's not, not what it is. I mean, get going with spending what's there. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing opportunity. And, and if you, if you spend it on the right things, you'll show the value in that allocation. And, and I think it can grow. Um, one thing we found when, when Trudeau was elected and we had a bit of a, a generational change in our leadership, um, a, a different way of thinking, there were big announcements and in infrastructure funding, um, but you know, five, six years later, the money hasn't flowed. So, I mean, the second thing is make, making sure you get it. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't get hung up on which project just do something, make sure it's getting you towards the goal, start spending it and show how um, you're improving, uh, you know, the massive challenges we have. Well, speaking of that, at the end of September, we had spent um, in this country 5% of the ARP money. I, I don't know what it is today, but that's, that's pretty low, right? I think Stephanie and I have spent like three and a half percent of it just yeah. on our own. <laughs> Could do better. Um, well, I was going to jump into something else, but you mentioned um, universal basic mobility, mobility wallets. So I, I feel like I've been out there trying to get tech companies to build a real mobility wallet for years. It doesn't exist, right? We got all these aggregation apps, but there's no place to actually put your money. Um, I mean, there's a lot of energy now. Like we worked for two years on the Pittsburgh program. Right, which integrated all the 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 different technologies, you know, Spin and 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 Zipcar and Masabi and all this stuff, and it was hard to do. But now there's like a formula for that, and then we're doing a universal basic mobility. They're calling it guaranteed mobility pilot, five hundred dollars, I think, for hundred families to start. R.K. Mellon put like a bunch of money up for that. There's money out there to do innovative stuff. I think USDOT will be up for it, as you said, to, to really try some of these things. Um, but what are, the, what are the biggest barriers to, to this happening? Like we know transportation services don't make any money, right? That, that there's a reason that it's all subsidized. Uber's lost what, $14 billion? I, I think I was here two years ago, I think it was 12 billion I said on stage. So what do you guys think about how we're gonna get to the point where we're actually subsidizing so everybody has access to mobility, not just the Metro, but all the first last mile services to get people there? What is it gonna take? Uh, we're gonna have to bust a lot of the behind the scenes payment monopolies, sorry. Um, Say to some of my friends who are probably here from some of those companies. Earmuffs. Uh, right, earmuffs. <laughs> but that is something only government can do, yeah. I think, uh, or build something, yes, and, right, that some of that, you know, back in the 90s, you know, we revolutionized transit fare media by giving people these little plastic cards that you can get in many cities around the world right now. And that's fantastic because that was a first step towards like a mobility wallet or, mm -hmm. or a seamless system. But now, you know, that's very out of date and it actually creates a barrier. Um, you can get my transit ride uh, costs 50 cents, 35 cents if you have a tap card, but the majority of my riders still pay in coins because just getting a tap card and having money on it and keeping that cash from being liquid in their pockets is too big of a trade-off yeah. for them. Right. So, uh, and then there are other riders who just wanna use their damn debit card because they're here from out of town and they don't wanna figure it all out. Uh, but that's something that can only be done at the state and really the national level is figuring out that piece of, mm -hmm. of uh, mobility wallet at universal basic mobility. I think that's a really key piece. And then the second piece is, 
we have really uh, done, we, we can do so much better in investing in what I'll call community infrastructure. So I mentioned the gender equity study earlier. One of the outcomes from that is that there is actually a driver's license gender gap of about 20% in Watts, which is a black neighborhood, low income neighborhood in Los Angeles. Um, I can give them all the EV car sharing services in the world, but half of that population will be locked out of using it because they don't have a driver's license. So whose job is that to close that gap? And I think if we really- I think Jerry, it's Jerry. Care about <laughs> Jerry. He, I really wanna hear what Canadian snippiness sounds like. You mentioned it, but it, it sounded more like a unicorn or something that you've dreamed about, but not a real thing. Um, but I will say, you know, that community infrastructure and yeah. actually empowering the through community based research people to design those systems mm -hmm. is very scary for government because it means we have to release control. But I think that is has been one of the key missing pieces mm -hmm. to getting to a universal basic mobility program is thinking about community infrastructure and workforce and all the rest of it, the same way we think about you know, lines on the street and vehicles that we procure. But that means you have to go beyond the, the mobility department or the transportation department. It means you have to actually break down the silos, uh, work with all of government, and then you got to work from the bottom up with the people. Yeah, That sounds hard. Yeah, it, it, it very much is, um, but it's not impossible. Um, I think what you have to have actually is political will and support because all of these are new ideas um, and new challenges that will never get passed if you don't have the political support. As an example, in Miami-Dade County, we just went through a, a significant bus optimization project called the Better Bus, Better Bus Network that actually started off as an advocacy project. It wasn't led by the department. It was led by a advocacy group called Transit Alliance. And it started off as the Better Bus Project. They got the buy-in from our Board of County Commissioners ended up uh, getting their support where it transitioned to uh, my department to help implement. And we just got this Better Bus project that's now the Better Bus Network approved uh, last month. And it's gonna increase the number of high frequency routes, uh, provide greater connection to uh, the individuals that are socially disadvantaged. Uh, we'll have a doubling of the access of people in poverty to high frequency routes. Um, and more jobs within a 45 minutes or circumference within a lot of our major uh, corridors. And so it's, it's a, that would have never happened if we did not do the grunt work and give up some ownership of the process to advocacy groups to get buy-in that our political establishment can go ahead and be comfortable with uh, approving as we just did. So, so it can be done, it's very difficult. And you just have to stick in there and hang in there. I think also structurally, there has to be a change to get rid of these barriers. Um, something as simple as offering free transit on election day. We had a serious debate internally as to whether or not it should include bike share, right? And when we talk about universal basic mobility, the right. paradigm shift um, is for people to have access to all of those options and not be mode specific, which actually means I think in my two decades in this business. So we have to look at uh, the grantors who are prescribing that this money can only be used on bus and this money can only be used on bike share or on demand. And um, they need that paradigm shift to say, we need the flexibility to ensure this universal basic mobility for everyone. And that's really a huge barrier. It's a real, real shift for people. Sounds like we need empathy. <laughs> yes. First, empathy. start empathy. with empathy. Yes. And I know um, your mayor, uh, Daniela Levine Cava, is amazing and very empathetic. And that's sort of how she's, in my conversation, that's how she starts everything. Absolutely. And, and that's the benefit of having somebody that grew up uh, with a nonprofit background and a social worker. And a and, woman. And, 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 and a woman. And, and a historical event that the first woman mayor from Miami-Dade County. And so, you know, her fortitude at this point being new, she just newly elected, uh, is amazing to see as somebody coming in new. So, so kudos to her and kudos to all the women that are running the show. Yeah, so we need more. Yeah. So one, one of the things, one of the things we've clearly seen with COVID is just the disproportionate impacts that it's had 
and how unfair it's been on society. So when we think about subsidizing or, or increasing access, we're trying to be more targeted because there's many companies and many individuals that are having record sales years, doing better than they've ever done before. And, and yet the, the ones, uh, people that can least afford it have been hammered and, and are really suffering. So, so we're trying to be really careful about um, who we assist and how we assist. And so we're getting the biggest bang for the buck. And so we're not giving uh, scarce resources to those that really don't need it and should be contributing more. Um, also rethinking government's role in it. You, you talked about the, the wallet, but it's you know much more than that, even emerging technologies and how, how can we as government help and what's our role? We, we've got big budgets, our, our budget's about two and a half, not, not nearly as big as yours, but our budgets are about two and a half billion dollars a year. And so how do we target that spend? How, we, how do we, not only from an economic development perspective, how do we maximize the local benefits of that spend every year? How do we develop um, you know, homegrown technologies and, and, and support those either, either through policy work that requires it be used or with our capital spend. So we're, we're investing in new technology, taking a bit of a chance uh, to move those things forward. And, uh, and, and in our big capital projects, how do we develop? We're doing a lot of uh, development work with our First Nations communities uh, to give them economic benefits from our big capital spend every year. So they're creating district energy systems to um, you know, take the heat from our sewer system and distribute it to, uh, uh, to neighborhoods and, and they can make money from that. So um, you know, as government, we've got a very interesting opportunity to help catapult and, and support some of these things, either through our spend, through our policy. And, uh, and, and I think we should, um, at a local level, feel more powerful because we can actually affect the change. We're the closest form of government to the people. Uh, we get phone calls and emails all the time at the federal level, at the state level, they don't. And, um, and we, can, we can make change uh, much more quickly. Awesome. Um, I'm going to combine my last two questions, I think, so that we leave some time for audience questions. Um, so I was going to ask a question about, you know, we have so many private sector friends here, and I should have thanked them also at the beginning for, you know, helping to put this all together and sponsor it and everything. Um, but we can't do our work in the, in the public sector without the private sector. And it seems like right now, like these are some of the most creative leaders we have in, in government. Um, we need the same creativity from the private sector and we have to come together and work. And you know, one of the, uh, the other question I was gonna ask was about electrification of the transportation system, which is so complex. Like we're, we're talking to and working with a bunch of cities on this. And it's like just daunting when you start to unpack it and you realize you gotta work with the regional utility, you have to work regionally period, you got to upgrade the system, you got to think about curbside charging, you got to think about behind the fence charging, you got to think about rolling stock. Um, I actually thought we could start with you, Stephanie, because you got measure M and you're, I mean, you're leading the country in electrification of transit by a long shot, I think. Um, how do you think about that? And how do you think about the private sector and like the like electrification as a service, right? Versus doing it all yourself? Mm. Well, we cannot do this by ourselves. Um, and we actually, our board recently uh, passed a motion to direct us to work more closely with our partners in the region on how we're going to get to zero emission by 2030, particularly in leveraging shared infrastructure if we can, charging infrastructure. But um, this is a perfect example uh, of a project that we cannot accomplish without private sector. And in fact, our utility partners, as well as the private sector has been critical in helping us develop a roadmap. But our, our challenges are great. Um, they're twofold. Um, the technology needs to mature even more, um, whether it's range, et cetera, we, we have, uh, you know, our, our service area is large and it's not um, a uniform service area. So we have significant challenges there. Um, and then, you know, we need the price of the technology to get reduced, yeah. right? I mean, we're looking at a, a billion dollar funding gap to convert uh, over 2000 of our fleet to electric. Now, this bill will help a little bit, but we'd really like to see the maturity of the technology and the price comp competition come down so that we can really make this goal. Um, but there's no doubt, um, we've had to work closely with the private sector in devising our concepts and plans and we'll continue to do so. 
Yeah, I think electrification for the transit fleet is a great opportunity for uh, for us to aggregate our market power and nudge and signal the market to create yes. more companies that are willing to show up and do this. And because we're government, we can do things like insist that our uh, the folks we work with, um, you know, offer collective bargaining units and good jobs and um, you know living wages and things like that, which is which has a, a another you know way that we can we can offer benefits. Um, LADOT just got a, a, a grant to do one of the largest um, uh, investments in transit charging infrastructure in the United States and using solar and, and microgrid storage on site because up until uh, I think last year, we had put in the largest order for EV buses in the country. Um, but it was still, you know, it was 129 buses, right? That's that's just a that's just a pittance. But most of the transit agencies are struggling with the same issues we struggled with. Uh, you know, there's a chicken and egg issue with manufacturers. So we have to signal that we're going to go there before the manufacturers really show up. Um, there's a, a cost issue. There's still a delta in the cost that we have to grapple with. And then there's the facilities and charging issues um, that we really have to deal with. And so the the private sector is essential, um, but it, there's also just a um, more, there's investment that can only happen on the scale of, you know, Jerry's budget or, or Stephanie's budget or Ulysses budget to nudge and, and reassure companies that there is a business model here. Right, right. And like, there are all these new models, like I know Montgomery, Maryland, Montgomery County, Maryland, this company came in and they're financing like 2,200 buses, all the charging and doing the operations and maintenance, not the driving. That's the union and all that. And I'm like, wow. And there's just a payment every year. You know, the, these some of these models are really cool. And like some of the um, money from the federal government is going to require a 20% match from the private sector, which I thought was really interesting. So again, it's going to need some creativity, right? But also the policy issue too. So I mean, for cities, your, your zoning and your building bylaws, you know, all new construction require on-site charging or at the very least the electrical systems uh, be set up so they can add charging. So um, in Vancouver, it was a two-step process. First, for all new multifamily buildings, they had to be wired for charging in the underground parkades. And then the second step was they had to put in the facilities right away. So, I mean, that's one of our biggest challenges we've got now is older um, multifamily buildings where people can't get charging, so they're having to charge on street. And, and as yeah. you're building new neighborhoods, requiring that we put in charging on street. It, the, the challenge is huge, but you know, how do you take on a huge challenge one step at a time and just start putting some of those policies in place? And, and again, I don't worry too much about the end state because we're gonna get there and it's really, really complex. And if we look at all the issues now, it's daunting and, and we may not get started. You know, if you've seen the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? So in the 90s, we had two of those electric cars in our in our city fleet, the Think City and the electric Ford Ranger. They worked just great. So, I mean, the stuff's been around. Just start buying it, start including it in your zoning bylaws yeah. uh, so that we're building it bit by bit. Yep. Yep. I feel like we lost five minutes off the clock. I, 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 <laughs> something happened. Are they trying to catch up maybe? Well, do we have time for a couple questions? Yes? Thank you. Um, I live in Los Angeles and prior to that I lived in Miami, then prior to that I lived in London and prior to that I lived in Dubai. So I'm well versed with public transportation and what's happening here. And now I head a nonprofit that focuses on marketing communications. It's a different perspective to be here in this event, looking at everything you're saying, which is really, really important. Um, one thing, especially with infrastructure bill, uh, what is the responsibility for public wide communication in terms of uh, attitudes and cultures Number one, I know people who are opposed to public transportation, no matter what you give them, because it's a perception thing of who you are if you get in a transit. And I also know people who don't get the benefit of that because the people who can but won't take it, you know, won't leave the chance to those who actually, no matter what you do, no matter how many free things you put out there. And my point is, I feel there is a responsibility to actually communicate from your angles um, those changes and, and how to attract what we're trying to do also for climate. My five seconds, uh, we got a K through gray program going on. We're focusing on the youth. We think if we cultivate lifelong writers, 
um, that way we started with our fearless program K through 14 so we really think that will be the key is getting this current generation um, to be lifelong writers. Yeah, adults are finished, right? So, <laughs> exactly. So start start with the youth, try to grow them up to, to make sure that they understand that there's no stigma but behind riding a bus. It's a cultural thing. Um, and so to your point, I think part of this is making sure that we one deliver the right service, reliable, clean, and safe. But then how do you communicate that out and start very young? That might be the only question if that if that time is right but why don't we close with the you know I'll, I'll like a fun question so when i wrote my book five years ago i, I theorized that eventually people would just hang out in their neighborhoods they wouldn't really travel too much yeah and you said we'd be holograms yeah also if memory serves i'm not really here yeah yeah <laughs> well i think i said by like 2030 we'd be giving speeches like this you know from our living rooms so now we got the the metaverse which is a much more sort of complex version of what i was writing about what do you guys think? Metaverse, uh, awesome or overrated and hyped? <laughs> or do you even know what it is? All right, Greg hates it. What do you guys think? What do you mean? The Facebook metaverse? Terrible, well. F minus. <laughs> but if you mean uh, something else, which is something that I think is part of our digital transformation in cities, which is that we need to have a digital expression of our, our physical policies. Yep. Um, and that's part of what, you know, the, the work that we're doing in the Open Mobility Foundation, which is another great public private forum is all about. Um, but I do, but I do think that, uh, you know, when we saw the Pokemon metaverse emerge, yeah. uh, it was, it was not great. Yeah. Not great. Uh, and I think creates, uh, raises a lot of provocative questions for sure. Yeah, you could live and die in the, in the metaverse and not even know you're here. That's it's, what scares me. Uh, it's both. It's whatever we make it. I mean, there's going yeah. to be tremendous advantages, and there's going to be jerks out there that ruin things with it. And uh, that's just people. It could definitely change how much people move. That's for sure. Um, awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, I want to give our panel a round of applause. We are very lucky to have these folks in, in public service. And thanks all of you for coming in person today. Right, thanks, good job. Thanks.